Welcome back, I'm That Chemist, and today we have five important papers in organic synthesis for the month of September 2023. The first paper for today involves the reduction of esters directly to ethers through the use of titanium tetrachloride. The authors also report that boron trifluoride diethyl etherate can also be used if the corresponding alcohol is desired. While other reactions to do this sort of thing have been reported previously, such as the mixture of LAH and sodium borohydride with BF3 etherate, these weren't any conditions I had come across before, so I was quite pleased to see this type of chemistry happening at all, as ethers are quite challenging to synthesize using contemporary methods in organic chemistry. Obviously in these examples, you can see these are benzyl ethers. These could usually be added with like a benzyl bromide and the corresponding alcohol if a base like potassium hydride or sodium hydride is used. But in these cases, the conditions tend to be a little bit more harsh. So the use of BH3 and NH3 in the presence of titanium tetrachloride was nice to see. It is true that you can use thionoesters to make ethers, and this is a method I was familiar with, but trust me, if you've ever had to make a thionoester before, this method completely sucks. There isn't really a good way to make thionoesters, but there have been a couple reports in the past year or so that are promising. So since there's this past precedent of people doing this type of reduction, the authors decided to expand this work. A couple highlights of the scope are shown here. In these cases, you can see not only benzylic esters were used, there are many examples in the paper aside from the benzoate esters, just to show that this is a really useful methodology. Here you can see mostly ethyl esters were the starting materials forming ethyl ethers as the products, and you can also have some interesting functional groups such as this nitro group, which wasn't reduced, this bromide, which was tolerated, as well as this alkyne. They even showed one example, which they did on a 10 millimole scale. This is really mild chemistry at room temperature and ether, so I thought this was pretty cool. In addition, here are some examples of benzoates and heterobenzoates, where for instance this chloride is tolerated, this sulfur wasn't reduced whatsoever, and even this lactone was tolerated. We also have a pyridine as well as this iodide, and if you'd like to see all of the examples that the authors explored in their scope, I'd encourage you to check out the full paper. As I mentioned earlier, the authors could also prepare alcohols, if they used BF3 etherate instead of the titanium tetrachloride. This sort of reaction is already fairly well known with LAH. If you want to make an alcohol from an ester, that's really well known. So whether or not this chemistry is as useful remains to be seen. However, I will say that LAH would normally completely destroy those nitro groups, so there's at least potentially some utility there if you aren't aware of any other reducing agents that do this sort of thing. Spoiler alert, there are many reducing agents that do this sort of thing. The mechanism of this chemistry is as follows. Initially, you have the titanium tetrachloride coordinate to the carbonyl. This then makes it more electrophilic and makes it possible for a hydride delivery from the BH3. The BH3 can then form a complex to the oxygen as a BH2 group still coordinating to the nitrogen of the ammonia. And titanium tetrachloride can then go in and substitute that, releasing HCl as a product. Since the titanium is very oxophilic, this enables the elimination of this oxytitanium trichloride and forms an oxocarbenium, which can scavenge a hydride from the BH3 starting material. This then forms the ether. However, if BF3 etherate is used, a similar sort of process can occur, but instead, the BF3 can help liberate the OR group, forming an aldehyde instead. Once this aldehyde is formed, it can be easily reduced by the BH3 to form all sorts of boron-substituted products that will get converted to the final alcohol upon aqueous workup. I thought that this chemistry was pretty neat, and I like to see more innovation in the ether synthesis space. The second paper for today involves the use of photoredox catalysis to produce sulfonates from alcohols as well as bromides. This chemistry utilizes the Macmillan group's NHC-mediated carbon radical formation, where an alcohol group is readily converted into the corresponding radical, which can then trap sulfur dioxide. Alternatively, they can use their silane chemistry to produce a carbon-centered radical as well, and this chemistry has been used by a number of groups in the past. Once you have a sulfonate, because these can just be treated with, like, for example, N-chlorosuccinamide or some other halogen source, you can get sulfonyl halides, and this can be readily converted into other derivatives that are useful for medchem. So let's say you have an alcohol. You don't want an alcohol. You want to have a sulfonamide. Well, now you have a way to do that. So that's pretty convenient. The scope of this chemistry was quite good with what they showed. If you want to see all the examples that they explored, I'd encourage you to check out their full paper. This is the structure of their NHC reagent, and what happens is this will get attacked by the alcohol, and through the use of pyridine as a base, this forms an ether intermediate. This ether intermediate can then be excited by the photocatalyst, resulting in the formation of this carbamate as a byproduct where a C double bond O is coming off of here, as well as the generation of a carbon-centered radical. That carbon-centered radical can then encounter the sulfur dioxide, which then gets reduced to a sulfinate. 
The sulfinate can then be oxidized using an electrophilic fluorine source to form a sulfonyl fluoride. These are relatively stable compared to their chloride counterparts, which is why they're often prepared. Here are a number of different alcohol-containing functional groups which were readily transformed to the corresponding sulfonyl fluoride, showing the strength of this methodology. Now, if you have a bromide instead of an alcohol, you could do similar chemistry, but instead they use this super silane. A number of different derivatives of these have been made, such as TMSS, which is a tris trimethylsilosilane, but in this case they decided to use this adamantylamine trisylosilane instead. In this case, rather than treating it with an electrophilic fluorine source, they converted directly to the sulfonamide, and you can even see that a number of different pharmaceutically relevant scaffolds tolerated this method as well. Here's a couple of other cool examples that the authors explored, and if you'd like to see more, I'd encourage you to check out the full paper. The third paper for today is another etherification paper where, instead of taking an ester and converting it to an ether, we take an alcohol as well as a ketone or aldehyde, and in the presence of a Lewis acid with a silane reductant, we're afforded with ethers. The traditional ways to do this don't work too, too well, or they're really limited in terms of scope. And man, there's a lot of scope in this paper. They do a lot of library screening just to really show that this is potentially applicable to a lot of substrates. In this first scope, you can see that they take this ketone with a protected amine, and in the presence of TMS triflate as a Lewis acid with S6, which is the silane that they use for this reaction, they're afforded with ethers in decent yields by LCMS. In some cases, the authors purified these. You can see what the isolated yields are here in IY. And the reason that the colors for this are shown this way is this is a heat map. This is showing that these reactions had lower yields and these reactions had higher yields. So the ones on the top left are going to be low yielding substrates and the ones on the bottom right are going to be higher yielding substrates. So you can see a lot of functional groups, heterocycles, etc. in here. So this is clearly a methodology that's worth exploring if you need to make ethers and you're struggling to do so. In addition to exploring a wide range of alcohols, the authors also explored this chemistry with a protected version of prolanol with a number of different aldehydes and ketones. Again, we have this heat map. You can see that the top left ones were lower yielding, the bottom right we have higher yielding, and in general, a large functional group screen was well tolerated. For some reason, I'm charmed by 6L. So the product that the authors would make from this would have this prolanol forming an ether with this cyclobutanone, giving a product shown here. This is how the authors made the molecule, but I wonder if today's sponsor Reaxis has any alternative ideas about how we could make this molecule. Today we're going to test the retrosynthesis tool of Reaxis, and then we're going to display the only entries that we're interested in. We can also export them so that we can look at them later, such as if we wanted to send them to a peer or colleague. The retrosynthesis tool will predict a synthesis of the target molecule based on some similar reports in the literature. Some of these similar reactions will populate the results. Now, while there's a lot of different proposed conditions that Reaxis thinks are somewhat similar, there's only some of these conditions that are relevant to our molecule of interest. For example, we want to avoid the use of alkyl bromides or similar leaving groups. We want to go directly from an alcohol to an ether using two alcohols as coupling partners. So let's pick out some reaction conditions that do that. I've chosen two potential examples which I think show promise, and now we're going to selectively display only these two sets of conditions. We can come back later, and these two sets of conditions will still be here. Alternatively, if we want to export them, it's easy to do that too. Hopefully this has been helpful for showing you some of the useful stuff you can do with the Reaxis Retrosynthesis Planning Tool. Hopefully this will help you come up with new ideas for your research, which will help you solve problems faster. I want to thank Reaxis for their support of this channel. The fourth paper for today involves the addition of BF3K salts into Michael acceptors containing a B-mida group. This is really cool because it involves the use of photoredox catalysis to install one type of boron in the presence of another type of boron species, which can then be unmasked later for subsequent transformations, or used directly. The authors also make a number of header cycles, but I'm not going to be focusing on that too much in this presentation, as the exciting part for me is the addition of these BF3K salts into the Michael acceptors to produce a number of useful products. The way that they make their reagent is quite straightforward. They take this vinyl b mida group, this is what the B-mida group looks like if you haven't seen it before. It's just a little bit more stable because of the formation of a complex between the boron and the nitrogen coming off of this group. And by making this vinyl boronate, they're able to treat it with MCPBA, forming this epoxide, and through a Lewis acid-mediated rearrangement, get this alpha B-mida aldehyde. Alternatively, if they wanted a specific R group there, such as the cyclopropane group, they could employ another approach using osmium tetroxide to dihydroxylate this, followed by an acid-mediated 1-2 shift to afford the corresponding aldehyde. Finally, if the R group was an H, they could just do a palladium silver-mediated rearrangement with terbutyl hydroperoxide to afford the simple product as shown here. 
So this is how those types of building blocks are typically made. And in this paper, they end up generating radicals from BF3K salts to add them into Michael acceptors. Just to show you some examples, if you want to see more, you should check out the full paper. They are able to introduce both tertiary, secondary, and primary alkyl trifluoroborates containing a number of interesting functional groups. When you compare this to the starting material, you can clearly see that there's a lot of new functionality introduced, and this isn't probably a way you'd normally think to form a quaternary center. So this is pretty good, and you also still have this boron group, which you could do subsequent transformations on. The mechanism of this chemistry is relatively straightforward. The BF3K salt is hit by the excited photocatalyst, which then generates a carbon-centered radical and reduces the excited iridium back to iridium-2. This can then couple with the acrolein derivative, which then generates an alpha radical, which can then get reduced by iridium-2 to form iridium-3, as well as the corresponding anion, which could then get protonated by solvent or during workup. When the authors added D2O to their experiments, in this case you can see there's 50 equivalents of D2O, they observed incorporation of deuterium into the alpha position. However, when they took the final product and treated that with D2O, there was no deuterium incorporation, which suggests that the D2O that's traced present in the reaction is where this comes from. It's not through some equilibrium type process happening after the reaction occurs. This first experiment here with the cyclopropane is just a radical trapping experiment. You can see radical ring opening of the cyclopropane, which is why they have an alkene in their product. The fifth and final paper for today comes from EJ Corey. He's still publishing at 95. And I really like this paper. Essentially, this is like a way to do ozonolysis or related dihydroxylation type reactions, but using nitrosyl derivatives. The way that this is done is at minus 78, for example, nitrosyl triflate will do an addition, forming this oxazidium as a cycloadduct. Depending on how this is treated as a quench, a number of different products can form. Due to the simplicity of the preparation of the starting reagent, I thought this was a really convenient methodology. Maybe this will replace osmium tetroxide and ozonolysis. I guess we'll have to see. The way that they generate their reagent is by the treatment of tetrabutyl ammonium nitrite with triflic anhydride. When this is done, they get nitrosyl triflate. Alternatively, if you wanted to get N2O5, you could do the same thing, but then add more equivalents of the nitrite. So what they do is they just treat their alkene substrate with nitrosyl triflate at minus 78 in DCM, and this affords the authors with the corresponding dialdehyde. Alternatively, if they treated it with nitrosyl triflate at minus 78, and then they treated it with triethylamine in a second step at minus 78, they instead are afforded with a diketone. In this next substrate, the authors show that they could selectively open up the norbornean ring to a dialdehyde. But when they treated it with triethylamine instead, they were once again afforded with the 1,2-dicarbonyl. There are many other examples of this, so I won't go into them too much, but you can see in example 47, this even worked on cyclooctatetrine forming a very conjugated product. In this example, they show how the cyclooctene could be treated under a number of different conditions to afford different sorts of products. In this first example, you can see that this alpha hydroxy oxime is formed, while in the case of 33, this alpha hydroxy ketone is formed. Depending on how they do the workup, they actually form the imine, the NH imine, which can be hydrolyzed finally to afford the corresponding ketone, but in this case, they get the oxime because they chlorinate the imine, and upon hydrolysis, this affords them with the oxime instead of the N-chloroimine. If instead they reduce it with LAH, they get the hydroxylamine. And all of these reactions are occurring through the intermediate 26B. One other reaction here that I liked, this is probably well known, I just hadn't seen this before, is if you make this imine 27, which is the same intermediate I was just talking about, if this is treated with zinc and acetic acid and acetic anhydride, you're afforded with the acetamide. And so I kind of like this reduction. If you've seen this used before, I'd like to see more examples down below. I always like a good paper. And yeah, I thought this chemistry is really interesting. If you thought this is good, let me know down below and I'll try and show more useful chemistry like this in the future. We have a few honorable mentions this month which I'd encourage you to check out. I didn't include this, but there was a recent paper in OPRD talking about NBS in DMF being a potential safety concern. So if you're doing any brominations in DMF with NBS, you might want to give it a read. We'll probably cover it in the next month's important papers, but because a number of you are doing synthesis on an ongoing basis, I thought it would be worth mentioning here nonetheless. I hope this has been insightful. Thanks for watching, and I hope you have a great day.